sang Psalm 51 because it's a psalm of confession, and uh, we're dealing with the book of Judges this evening, which is dealing with constant confession of the sins of God's people. And uh, so with that in mind, I invite you to turn now your copy of God's Word to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, and in your pew Bible, you'll find that on page 237. We come to this book this evening in our series through the entire Bible, one sermon on every book of the Bible. The goal, of course, is to become more familiar with our Bible so that we would know the context and the content, that we would be able to understand it better as we read it, uh, but also to read and to go through the entire Bible is to see the storyline of salvation, to see where God's people have been and trace that all the way to the cross unto today. And uh, the book of Judges shows us a very dark period in, uh, in the life of Israel. We're going to read all of chapter 2 into chapter 3. And so we have a little bit of a large reading, uh, but I couldn't pick and choose, and so I just chose the whole thing. Uh, but most of chapter 2 is really kind of a summary of the book as a whole, and so it's helpful to that end. So let's give our attention now to God's Word, Judges 2, and we begin at verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you. But they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. They called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Perez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord, or the work that he had done for Israel. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord and the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from, other, from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Asheroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to, the plunder, to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges. For they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died... They turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the, angel, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. In order to test Israel by them, 
whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and He did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians and the Hivites, who lived, in, lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel, to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And as always, as we come to God's word, we are dependent on God the Holy Spirit. Let's pray now for His illuminating presence. Our great God and our Father, we are reminded from Your word, from Genesis to Revelation, that we are a people born in sin, a people who struggle with sin, and a people who, apart from your grace, would wander from you into further sin. Oh, Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who came to save us. Father, tonight, as we come to understand the book of Judges, we pray, O Lord, give us understanding. Teach us from your word. Father, you have promised that the study of your word will bear fruit in the lives of your children. So do that, we pray, that we would see the fruit of knowing your word better. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, when it comes to having a cavity, if you've ever had one before, you know that tooth decay or tooth rot, whatever it is that the dentist is going to warn you of, can be kind of a painful and costly thing. One of my boys actually went in for a dentist appointment, thankfully, got a good report, no cavities, no expensive bills to deal with. Uh, But if you've ever had a cavity before, you know that there's really a couple of steps you need to take. One, you need to have that cavity filled. You need to drill out the rot. You need to remove it and actually go down into the healthy part of the tooth. And then you need to fill it. You need to replace it with a filling. And then the doctor's going to tell you the third step is you need to take better care of that tooth. Once you've exposed it, once that rot is there, you may have filled it, but it's more exposed, it's more prone to rot. And so you need to be very careful because of the vulnerability of that tooth. Uh, lest it go further and it return. And that could be the case. You could actually lose the entire tooth if you allow decay to return. Well, this evening, I think that's a helpful analogy to understand really what the big picture of Judges is all about. From beginning to end, if there's really one word that came to my mind this week in study of it, it's this, decay. Spiritual decay in the hearts and lives of God's people. Judges teaches us that that when people are prone to go their own way, or when they do go their own way, when they allow spiritual decay to enter into their own lives, the lives of their family, it does not stay there. It grows. Spiritual decay spills over into the lives of our families, the lives of our grandchildren. It spills over into the generations that follow. And that theme is found on full display in the book of Judges. Generation after generation, what we see is the failure over and over to the point where by the end of the book, the big picture is how great the decay really has been. Judges shows generations turn away from God. God comes to them. They repent. He brings them back only to have them return once again and to fall into greater wickedness, greater idolatry, greater spiritual decay. And uh, so with that in mind, to come to the book this evening, here's the theme that I put to the book of Judges. Broadly speaking, the book of Judges teaches us God's persistent grace pursuing a wandering people. God's persistent grace pursuing a wandering people. In other words, for all the decay, for all of the, the rottingness spiritually, really what we see is a God who never lets go of a wandering people. And as we've been doing with the previous books, we're going to use the same four-point questionnaire or four-point outline that you'll have actually in your bulletin, the context, the content, the church, and then the Christ of the book, those four headings this evening. 
So first of all, we need to ask the question, what is the context of the book of Judges? And in many ways, if you're here last week, the context should be very familiar to you. It is the death of Joshua. It is the death of that second generation that entered into the promised land and really in many ways, overwhelmingly, to to large measure, was faithful to God. Though we do see that they weren't completely faithful in the chapters that we just read. Uh, One of the big things about the context, though, is the, that the book of Judges is in arguing for something. Uh, when you get to the end of the book, a number of times there's going to be a reoccurring line that the author puts at the very end to catch your attention, that is this. In those days there was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so the first thing we need to understand about the context is that there's an argument being made here. The author records this as history, theological history as we've seen, But particularly, the author structures everything so by the end of the book, you have one theme in mind, that we need a king. Israel's problem was they did not have a leader, a righteous leader, and therefore when there was no one leading them, they all went astray like lambs without a shepherd. Actually, the chapter we just read shows us that the book begins kind of setting forth that problem. We just read that Joshua died, and the generation, you notice, of the elders, the leaders of Israel, They also died. And that raises the question, what are they going to do with a generation that did not know what it was to trust the Lord? What is this generation going to do with with elders overseeing the congregation who did not know what it is to trust God, to go into battle, having God lead them? And of course, we see the book. The problem is with elders who go astray is that the people go astray. And when the people go astray, their children go astray. And the generation itself goes astray. So the context here is the argument that we need a king, or God's people need a king. The other part of the context that's helpful is that the book of Judges is really what we call an outworking of Deuteronomy, or the Deuteronomic Code, or whatever we want to put that. Uh, But really, in many ways, I don't think it's to overstate the case that if you don't know Deuteronomy, you really will struggle to understand Judges. Judges is really a reflection and outworking of everything God told Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. The warnings of Deuteronomy take place in this book, and the curses and the discipline of Deuteronomy are found in this book. Let me give you a couple of examples that chapter 2 actually gave us. You have your copy of God's Word open. You'll note that there's three failures in chapter 2 and 3 that you will find explicitly warned in Deuteronomy. First failure warned from Deuteronomy is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It's kind of the obvious one. That Israel did not fully drive out the wicked nations as God commanded. Verses 1 through 5, God comes to them. The angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, comes and He says, you failed. You didn't just do an oopsie. This is sin. You blatantly disregarded, you blatantly disobeyed what I gave you to do in the book of Deuteronomy. And when you read in the book of Deuteronomy, especially in the first number of chapters, over and over, God says, I'm sending you in. Drive them out. Make a full end. Because if you leave them, there'll be a snare snare to you. You'll be tempted to go the way they have gone. You'll be tempted to worship their gods. So the first failure that comes out of the book of Deuteronomy is Israel did not do so. And what's interesting about the language here is that the reason they did not do so ultimately was because they were apathetic. They grew apathetic with the commands of God, and they were half-hearted. In chapter 1, actually, uh, that records a number of tribes who did not make a full end, and so they made workers out of them. They made slaves out of the nations. God never told them to do that. That was half-hearted obedience. It was half-obedience, and God says, you failed. You disobeyed me because you did not fully obey. So that's the first thing to know. They did not drive out the nations. Second failure warned from the book of Deuteronomy is in verses 11 through 15 of chapter 2. The failure was that Israel began to worship false gods alongside of the one true God. What should soberize me and what should soberize you this evening, one generation, it's all it took for the apostasy of Israel. One generation, the grandchildren of the people who entered the promised land apostated because they forgot the Lord and began to join with the world, worship the gods of the world. They broke covenant with their God. These circumcised youth who had God's covenant became covenant breakers in one generation, and they turned their back on the covenant they were born into. 
And you notice it's descriptive. In verse 17 of chapter 2, uh, they really committed spiritual adultery. You notice there that they whored after false gods. These were covenant children. They were born in a covenant relationship. We've been seeing from the beginning that God's covenant is like a marriage. And to these children who, they were not at Mount Sinai, they were born into this, God says, you broke the relationship. You're committing spiritual adultery by leaving your relationship with me and going to join the world. They worshipped false gods and broke covenant with the one true God. And the third failure, which is explicitly warned in Deuteronomy, is in chapter 3, verse 6. The failures that Israel permitted intermarriage with their children and the world. In verse 6, we're told that they gave their daughters to the young men of the unbelievers, and they took daughters of unbelievers to marry their sons. Now, if you turn to Deuteronomy 7, there are other passages in Deuteronomy, but Deuteronomy 7 is explicit. God says, you are not allowed to let your children marry unbelievers. If you allow your children to marry them, what's going to happen? Your grandchildren will fall away. There will be wonders because of this. And that's exactly what we see over and over in the book of Judges. Parents were apathetic, allowed intermarriage with the world, and what happened? The grandchildren were not discipled. The hearts of their grandchildren wandered away because of the mixed marriages that the parents allowed to take place. Deuteronomy was explicit in that warning in chapter 7 not to do that, and that was part of the reason for the book of Judges. Here's the point. The context here really is an outworking of the book of Deuteronomy. You see exactly what Deuteronomy was about, the failure and the consequences of that failure over and over and over in the book of Deuteronomy, or in the book of Judges, rather. But secondly, notice our next question that we ask of every book. What is the content of the book of Judges? That, of course, is our big point as we try to grapple with, try to summarize uh, the content of what the book is all about. So let's list a couple of things here. First of all, by way of content, the structure. Uh, sometimes structure is not important. Oftentimes the structure is important. The book of Judges, the structure is very important. If you have a study Bible, I'd encourage you to look at the outline because the outline, the structure of the book is intentional. The author is taking us through three stages, three clear stages, three outlines to lead us to a point where we see the progressive decline in the people of Israel. So the three sections are this. First of all, in chapters 1 through chapter 3, verse 6, you have what I titled a description of disobedience. A description of what Israel failed to do that led to the eventual decay in the generations that follow. I've already mentioned it. Chapter 1, they did not make a full driving out of enemies. They allowed them to become servants and they allowed them to be there. God says, listen, that's half obedience. And half obedience is disobedience. If you don't fully obey me, we call that disobedience. God says, you disobeyed me. Chapter 2, God says, because of this, I will not go with you into battle anymore. I will not bless your conquest. And now when you go into battle, I'm against you. Deuteronomy warned that this would be the case. This would be the punishment for disobedience. And interestingly, in chapter 2, verses 12 to 23, when the description of disobedience, we actually have the summary of what's going to happen. We're told that Israel would fall away. And when Israel would fall away, God says, I will bring the curse of Deuteronomy on you and I'll bring foreign armies in. And then we read there that they would cry out to God. And when God would hear their cry, God would respond. He'd raise up a judge from their midst and and that judge would deliver God's people. And through the lifespan of that judge, God would be with them to bless God's people. But then we read in chapter 2, when that judge died, what happened? people of Israel fell away again. But notice your text. Look at verse 19. You notice they didn't just fall away again. Look at verse 19. They became more corrupt. They became more sinful than the generation that went before them. See, the the storyline of Judges is meant to show you it's a downward spiral. Every generation is going to get more sinful. And interestingly, every judge that followed becomes less faithful. Samson will be the last judge you see, and Samson is one of the most sinful of all the judges. Why? There's a downward spiral. There's decay in God's people. The more sin is allowed, the more people become corrupt, and by the end of the story, we'll talk about that, it becomes absolutely outlandish how spiritually decayed God's people have become. The structure is important. So that, that's the first section, chapters 1 through chapter 3, verse 6. A description of disobedience. Second section is the big one. 
chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 16. This is the bulk of the book. I titled it, The Downfall of Disobedience. In these chapters, it records 12 judges that God uses and 12 times God's people fall back into sin. You have 12 judges. You have six well-known judges. These are the ones that we know from Bible school. And then you have six minor judges, six lesser-known judges uh, that God records here. And these judges do overlap. Uh, They did not rule over all Israel at this time, but their influence was more local. Um, What you have in the book of Judges covers roughly, estimately, about 350 years, give or take a little. The reason that's kind of difficult is because these judges did overlap a little, but if you kind of put them together, and our best estimate is uh, the book of Judges covers 350 years. Now, in those chapters, you have the well-known judges like Ehud, right? That left-handed warrior who stabs uh, Eglon, and uh, we have kind of the uncomfortable potty humor story of the death of Eglon and how he delivered God's people, right? We have Gideon, the man who led 300 men with torches and trumpets, and God gave a strong victory. We have all of these well-known, and mixed in there, we have the minor judges like Shamgar, uh, who we actually learned from his name had mixed parents. We have Tola, Jar, Isban, or no, Izan, Eblon, and Abdon, lesser-known judges, but yet used by God to deliver God's people. And as I said at the beginning, the point of knowing these judges is as you see them recorded, they're spiraling down. The judges become less and less faithful as God raises them up. And then lastly, the third section of the book is chapter 17 through 21. I titled this The Decay of Disobedience. And these are the most uncomfortable, difficult chapters in all of the book because in chapter 17 through 21, you have two stories that record the absolute depravity of how bad it got in Israel when they turned their back on God. In chapter 17 through 18, you have the story of the tribe of Dan stealing a Levite and the idols of a man named Micah. A few years ago when we preached through that, I mean, it's, I remember working on the sermons, there is no good guy in that story. Everybody's bad. Everyone's doing sin. A father stealing from his mother. The mother kind of is accusing the son. You have robbery. You have superstition. You have pagan practices. And by the end of the story, uh, Micah, uh, the man, actually is stolen from and God's people are yelling at one another. Absolute sinful chaos. And then you have the worst story yet. In chapter 19, chapters 19 through 21, you have the account of literally a civil war with the tribes of Israel against the tribe of Benjamin over the brutal rape and murder of a Levite's concubine. Probably the most uncomfortable chapter is chapter 19. And when you read chapter 19, it should sound very similar to or sound very familiar to you because when you read it, it is written in such a way to remind you of Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. It is to remind you that when Israel turned their back, when depravity and decay, when the children wandered away from what their parents taught them, what happened among the people of God? The Old Testament church begins to act like Sodom and Gomorrah. When Israel, God's people, turn their back on God, they look no different from the world. And the whole point of those stories is that you close the book of Judges and you sit back and you are meant to be amazed at how bad it got among a people of God who knew God, who had seen the power of God, who had witnessed His grace. To turn their back in one generation leads to absolute worldliness by the end of 350 years. Here's the point. The content or the structure is meant to show you the absolute decay of what happens when God's people, the Old Testament church, turn their back on God and act like the world. The other part of the content that I want to note is not just simply the structure, but also probably the second most main theme, or maybe I should say it's the main theme. Let me restate that. This is probably the main theme of the book, is that it teaches us God's persistent faithfulness. The content of the book of Judges is to teach you how good God is. God is faithful in the book of Judges in two ways. He's faithful to discipline his people. They broke covenant. And when you break covenant with God, God disciplines. And God is also faithful to come back for them. When they repent, when they cry out, what does God do? Does God turn his back on them? No, he comes for them. We see God's persistent faithfulness over and over and over coming back for his covenant people. 
We are reminded of God's persistent grace that He does not give up with His plan through Israel. You know, it's interesting, if you read Judges and you kind of read it through, there's almost a sense of you get frustrated. It's written that way. You are to be frustrated. You want to say, what's going on here? Don't you learn your lesson? Haven't you learned from your parents when they uh, fell away? Why don't you learn your lesson? Why are you back at your sin again? What's the point? Is to show you God is not like you and I. You and I would turn our back on Israel and say, hey, I'm going to find a people who can do it right. I'm going to find an obedient people, but that's not God. God sticks it out with persistent grace with a people like you and I who fall back into sin over and over and over again. Why? Judges is teaching us something. Our God is persistent with His grace. Not only that, we are reminded of God's amazing love. Uh, God is described throughout the book as a jealous husband because, again, they broke covenant. It's like a husband seeing a wife being unfaithful, and he brings discipline because of that. But the other imagery is of a father. We read it in chapter 2. When Israel was afflicted, how is God described? As a father who has compassion on his children. It's almost as if God's heart breaks when the foreign armies come in, when they're put to death, or when their crops are destroyed. What is going on in the heart of God? He's moved with pity for his people. He loves his people despite the just consequences of the sin. The book of Judges teaches you and I that we have a God of persistent faithfulness and grace. Third heading now. That is the content. Third heading now. What do we learn in this book about the church? What do we learn about the Old Testament church? Well, the first is kind of the second side of God's persistent faithfulness, and that is we learn of the church the warning of the danger of a cold heart towards God. Another one of the recurring lines you're going to hear over and over in the book of Judges is that that generation did not remember the Lord their God. Now, we could pass over that and say, okay, they they forgot, but we need to ask, what did they not remember? You need to understand, their problem was not intellectual. They knew the stories. Gideon knew the stories. He had been told the stories. The problem of remembrance was not that they didn't know their doctrine. It wasn't that they didn't have the, the head knowledge. No, they knew the teachings of their God. What was their problem? Their hearts went astray. They knew the stories of God. They knew the law of God. But they became apathetic and bored with the Lord their God. Over and over, every generation that falls, what's going on in the hearts of God's people? They're bored with God. They're bored with grace. They look at their neighbors worshiping their gods. And and by the way, if you look into what Baal worship is, Uh, It is graphic, sensual, sexual worship. And so the young men are looking at this and they're drawn to this and they're saying, hey, the worship of God is boring. Why why do I need to go? Uh, Worshiping God doesn't seem to make sense. This is exciting worship. Why can't we mix up a little of this? And they went astray following their fleshly desires. They were bored with God and their hearts were drawn to the worldly sinful pleasures of their neighbor. In many ways, their hearts were filled with discontentment because they never experienced battle, the previous thing. They never had to trust God to carry them through, and they were discontent with grace, and therefore they had cold hearts. The big problem with the generations of judges is not head knowledge. It's the heart condition. They were apathetic. They were cold-hearted towards God. They were not grateful, and the moment they became uh, uh, ungrateful was the moment they opened themselves up to idolatry. And we need to ask ourselves a question this evening, then, by way of personal application. We are reminded from the book of Judges that we must, by spiritual devotion, constantly be stoking the fire of our hearts to be warmed unto God that we would be filled with gratefulness. How do you and I keep from going down the path of constant stumbling into sin? How do you and I, what, what is the lesson you and I learn from the book of Judges? That the moment you are cold-hearted towards God is a moment you should be most afraid and get on your knees and ask God, warm my heart. Preach the gospel to yourself. The moment you grow cold-hearted and bored with God, you get on your knees and you remind yourself, I am a sinner. I deserve eternal hell, but Christ has died for me. God, don't let my heart go. Send me the Spirit. Warm my heart, because if you keep my heart, if, if my heart stays cold and I become discontent, I will seek things from the world to satisfy me, like we heard this morning. See, the people of Israel grow discontent and wanted to satisfy their hearts with the world. Let me ask you tonight, where is your heart today? What is going on in your heart? What is going on in my heart? Are you filled with gratitude today that God delivered you from hell? 
Are you thankful today for all of the gifts, all of the mercies that God pours out in abundance? Or perhaps you're here struggling with discontentment tonight. If it is discontentment, discontentment tonight, be warned from the book of Judges, go immediately to the Father, Son of Grace tonight, that your heart would not grow cold towards your God. So we're warned of a cold heart towards God as the church of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the second big, less, big lesson we learn as the church is the need for covenant discipleship with the generation that follows. We read it in chapter 2 through chapter 3. One of the reasons over and over given for the falling away of the generations is that the next generation gave up on the discipleship of the covenant in which they were born into. And again, as the first generation fell away immediately, which should soberize us and how quickly this can go. But here's the lesson. The parents of judges, the warning given here is that they did not disciple their children. They circumcised them, no doubt. But they did not come, to, they did not disciple them to claim that promise. And so the generation wandered away thinking they had no connection with God when all the while they were born in covenant with God and became covenant breakers by walking away. What is the lesson? I think the big lesson is to teach our children, you are a member of the church. You are a covenant member. You're born into God's grace and have a covenant relationship. And there's an obligation to that. Notice that. None of these generations stood at Mount Sinai. God never comes to them and says, hey, you weren't there when I made this covenant with your parents. So you didn't have a choice in the matter, so I'm not going to hold you. No, that's not how God works. God says, your parents covenanted with me. This is a covenant obligation with you and I. Be faithful. What is the lesson that we need to learn? That our children are born in a covenant relation to this God and we as parents are to disciple them, to hold them, to claim this and to, to not wander from it because there is this reality that our children are born into as members of the church. In the book of Judges, over and over the generations forgot that and became covenant breakers and were not discipled in the faith. So that's the church in the book. Fourthly, and finally, what do we learn about Christ in the book of Judges? And uh, there are no, no doubt many things we could say, but I have two things that we learn about Christ clearly from the book of Judges. The first is this. We need Christ to be our divine king. That line that I mentioned at the beginning, in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Is meant to remind you and I, we need a godly shepherd. We need a godly leader to constantly come alongside us because if we are left leaderless, we are wandering from our God. What is the good news of the gospel this evening? That we have a king who sits on a throne right now. That on Pentecost, he was crowned as king. He sits on a throne and we are ruled by the great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the greater judge who triumphed over our enemies on the cross of Calvary. He is the greater judge who does not die but sits on a throne and holds fast over us. One of the big themes of Judges is two things. One, righteous leaders bring out righteous followers. And two, the judges died, but our king never dies. By the end of the story, we realize that our great need is one, we need a righteous judge, and two, we need a judge who will never die. Believer, this evening, that is the good news of knowing Jesus Christ. He is our eternal king. He will never die. He will forever be our king. He sits on a throne, and his job is to walk with you and I through this life so that we are not left without a leader. We learn this evening that Jesus Christ is our divine king, the Davidic king who has come to sit on the throne forever to rule over us so that we are called to submit to him. Probably the application to that is realize that he's Lord of your life. Part of the problem with the generations and judges is they did not think God was Lord of their life. They could do whatever they wanted with their life. Believe this evening, be reminded, Christ is your Lord. He owns every aspect of your life in thought, word, and deed, and we are called to submit to him as our righteous leader. So we learn that he is our divine king. Other thing we learn about Christ in the book of Judges is our need for a savior. As I mentioned a few moments ago, reading through Judges is meant to wear you out. It is meant to frustrate you with the fickleness and the wandering nature of Israel as over and over and over the generations do not learn and they go back to sin over and over and over. It is meant to remind us we know that we need a savior, that Israel needed a savior, not just once, not twice, we needed a savior for all of our sins, past, present, and future. 
And it would be the height of hypocrisy to read the book of Judges and not understand that this is the cycle of your life and the cycle of my life. It doesn't take long to be a Christian to know that, it, that you will struggle with sin, you will stumble into sin, you will cry out, and God will lift you up, He will forgive your sin, He will cleanse you and put you back on the path, and the next moment you find yourself falling into sin once again. The book of Judges is really a mirror for you and I to see our own life. You and I are constantly struggling with sin, we're constantly struggling, and, and yes, there's growth in our life, praise God for that. But the book of Judges should encourage you, believer, God knows your struggle, and He has given abundant grace to forgive you of your sin today, tomorrow, and in the years to come. Judges reminds us we need a Savior. The Savior has come. On the cross of Calvary, He paid for all the sins of all His people, and we now stand as a forgiven people. That when we struggle, when we stumble into sin, when we walk into sin, we go before a Father who receives us. Why? Because Christ has died for us. He receives us. Why? Because he loved us while we were yet sinners and sent Christ to deal with our sin. The book of Judges teaches us this evening that we desperately needed a Savior. He has come, and we are called to follow him as our King and our Savior. By way of conclusion this evening, let me ask you a question by way of personal examination. Have you gotten exhausted with your own cycle of rebellion? Are you frustrated this evening with your own cycle of falling into the same sin over and over? Well, if you're like me, the answer is absolutely yes. What are you to do this evening? Be reminded that there's grace for you in that. That God picks you up. He delights in coming to you. He's a God of great compassion. He, ple- or he cares for you when you and I fall into sin. He picks us up. He never turns us away. Believer tonight, be reminded, in our pilgrimage in this life, we can run into the arms of Father through the shed blood of a Savior because of the triune love of our Almighty God. The warning of judges is to take, very care, to take great care lest we give ourselves over to spiritual decay. The joy of judges is knowing that by God's grace, He holds us, and we don't need just new, we don't need you just made to do better. We need to be made completely new, and that's exactly what the gospel is. He makes us new people with new hearts. He removes the spiritual decay, and He brings us home. Praise God for the gospel this evening that judges proclaims to sinners like you and I because of a God of amazing grace. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and our Heavenly Father this evening, we come before you with a book that in many ways speaks the truth of our own hearts. Father, like the hymn writer says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Oh, Father, tonight, that is the cry of your children tonight. We know the, the tendency to wander. We pray, oh Lord, for your grace that we would see Christ as our King, that we'd see Christ as our Savior more clearly now. And, and Father, we pray for that grace. Continue to clean us and walk with us and give us what we stand in need of. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.